Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Podcast. My name's Stu Turley. Have you ever wondered what's going on in the oil and gas space in the United States? It's kind of weird, but I'll tell you what. One of the things that's going on is talking to industry experts who actually understand what's going on with COP, what's going on with uh, the whole regulations through le uh, legislation through regulations. I have the Ann Bradbury here. She's the CEO at American Exploration and Production Council out of Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for stopping by. Thanks, Stu. I'm super excited to be here. I'll tell you what, I got to do a little inside baseball for our listeners. You and I have 99 connections on LinkedIn. You've, a lot got, of connections. A lot of, you've got a lot of good connections out there. A, you're smart. B, you, you've got a great organization out there fighting for the oil and gas industry. And I've interviewed 26 of our joint uh, connections on LinkedIn. That's bizarre. You must That's so be cool. You talk to a lot of good people. Uh, absolutely. So, hey, uh, you and I are going to be at NAEP next year. This yeah. is really a cool thing. We've got four booths. How many NAEPs have you been through? Believe it or not, Stu, this is my first NAEP. No way. It is. Yeah, I know all about it. I know exactly what it is. I've never been. I'm super pumped. Oh, well, I'll tell you what, the podcasts are way cool on the reach, and you just had David Blackman, and you've been with RT and a few others, and we kind of laughed and said, this is going to, the bar is now set low for this podcast. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, hey, tell us a little bit about what you thought about COP. There is some weird stuff coming out about COP right yeah. now. Yeah, so COP is still, I think it goes till tomorrow, technically. And uh, right now, the big news out of COP is um, you know, there was a big push from some European countries and others to sign a joint statement saying that we are, you know, endeavoring to uh, phase, quote unquote, phase out fossil fuels. Um <laughs> And uh, it seems like that has they have now pushed back on that. OPEC is getting a lot of the credit for being the ones <laughs> that stop it. But I think, you know, from what I'm reading, it's it's also some, you know, developing countries, like African nations that are like, yes. slow down, like we need fossil fuels. And so the environmentalists and Al Gore are now saying, oh, you know, throwing up their hands and saying, uh, you know, this is this is the worst thing ever. But, uh, you know, I think it's uh, actually a much better reflection on the reality of, right. uh, you know, the, the state of our world today and the need for fossil fuels uh, across the globe. Uh, yep. And, you know, it, so so that's that's the big hullabaloo at, at, at NAEP or excuse me, at uh, at COP this week. Isn't that nuts? And I, it's pretty funny when you have it in Dubai. The, the UAE is kind of like oil. You have the Saudi Arabia shows up with Saudi Aramco, and you and I were chit-chatting about this right before the show. Can you imagine the heads popping with all the uh, green-type uh, folks? Uh, pow, oh, pow, yeah. pow, 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 pow. It sounded like somebody doing, what is it, the popcorn you squish and everybody has, you instinctively. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you do that to bug uh, your family? Oh, the popcorn popcorn? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my kids do it. It drives me nuts. Um, but they get great joy out of it. So. Oh, yeah. I, I throw it down on the carpet and, you know, try to... Very satisfying. Oh, it is. You know, I feel good about myself. And my wife is like, you're 12. <laughs> so, okay. So not only that, we have... Uh, Bill Gates was there. Um, and I keep telling people that the only time I met him, I drove him nuts. I mean, I have that effect on people. And, you know, I wish I drove him a little more nuts. Maybe he wouldn't be the way he is now. But he said, uh, maybe, did you see that uh, uh, interview where he said, climate change is not going to kill us and it's not a big deal? And then I saw him interviewed at COP and goes, climate change is going to kill us? Yeah. yeah it's, uh, what's up with that noise? Um, and then, um, so you see all these uh, knuckleheads and it's the elite 1% are using more CO2 than the bottom 60%. They all, uh, 70,000 people, they cop. Yep. 
70,000 people a cop, probably a bunch who flew private jets to get there. Um, and, and so, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. And I, and I think it gets back to where, you know, we, we started this discussion, which is you've got to be realistic about global energy demand to ever right. have an, a, you know, honest conversation about climate because yep. countries are not going to choose having lower emissions over the ability to provide affordable and reliable energy to a growing population because energy is a hallmark of progress and it's we're so lucky and Europe is so right. fortunate that we have this abundant affordable reliable yep. sources of energy but the vast majority of the world is not that fortunate and so asking them yep. to give that up in the name of climate change it's it's just not going to happen whether you think it, it should, should or it shouldn't it is not going to happen no. and uh i think the sooner folks can come to grip with that reality the sooner we can have more realistic conversations you know when you we sit back and kind of look at uh the great emp operators and you work with uh, a lot of the big big guys mm -hmm. and uh what is it 50 percent of our oil is produced by the privates um, so the stats yeah. I know is that uh, over 80% of oil is produced by independents, Independent, both large and you. small. Yep. And, and AXPC represents just over 50% of production. Oh, okay. Great. Um, again, that's a o OSU crayon mass popping into my head there, but that's a lot of oil. It's a lot of oil. It's a lot of oil. It's a lot of, it's even more natural gas. Like it's, it's a lot. And we would be dead meat without our great exporting of LNG facilities. Uh, that is 100% right, even more so Europe, um, <laughs> <would be technically. laughs> our incredible LNG exports. And, you know, what I like, you know, I think the, the story of American LNG saving Europe's bacon over the last couple of years after the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, it's an incredible story. It's one we're very proud of. Couldn't right. have been possible without the shale revolution. But I also want to point out that because of that, exports to Asia were the lowest that they had been in several years. So so some of that was just moving cargoes around, right. not necessarily like sort of adding to the aggregate amount of LNG in the in the world. And so um, um let me ask this. Yeah. Russia uh, was supplying a lot to Asia. And then China was buying a lot of it and then reselling it. <laughs> so yeah. Russia actually got around sanctions by selling it to China and then China was selling it back to the EU. Talk about carbon emissions, having these things roll around the world. Uh, that are not uh, easily done. Right, right. Um, that's, that's absolutely true. Um, <laughs> and the point is like the world needs more US LNG, not just the ability to like move cargoes around, right? Because, yep. um, you know, you know, Russian gas is clearly significantly dirtier and right. you don't want to sort of enable this Russian China partnership that's emerging. Um, and so, you know, you know, super, you know, proud of the fact that we were able to provide so much US LNG to Europe, but we need to be able to do that without moving cargoes away from other places in the world. I think oh, that's yeah. really, really important. And so we need more export capacity. We need more pipeline capacity. Yeah. Poor old Pakistan. They had um, uh, one of their LNG uh, shipments stolen from somebody else, outbid. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. was like, that's not right. It, it's not. And, you know, it's, you know, countries like that can't afford to pay that premium when, you know, that those prices spike. Yeah. So the way to keep prices lower and, you know, more stable is to just put more LNG yeah. in the global marketplace. Are, are you seeing a lot more long-term contracts? Boy, I am. I mean, it seems kind of weird that our long-term contracts around the world, that's cool. Uh, you see uh, uh, Chenier and everybody else putting out long-term contracts. And Sean Strawbridge just got his new company going. Uh, oh, neat. Okay. Yeah, and he's doing cool. contracts around the world. Oh, so. nice. Isn't that cool? He's a that's cool cat. Cool. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, that's great. I mean, I think that's a super important uh, component of yeah. of this business, and you know, we need to continue to see more. 
Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think would help is if, you know, D.C. policymakers stop talking about, you know, the fact <laughs> that we're going to phase out fossil fuels, right? Because um, I do think that that sort of <laughs> counteracts this notion of, you know, can I make, is this a safe long-term 20-year investment, which, you know, I think we know it, it, it is. Um, I don't but, know how you do you know, there's it. This, and... There's this public, there's this other narrative out there that, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're going away, you know, within that time frame, which is, you know, just for, for your organization. I feel uh, I'd like to just say, uh, go ahead and put a memo out to your board and, and, and give you a bigger raise for being in Washington, D.C. <laughs> um, and then tell us what you do to try to help out our great American uh, producers. Yeah. So, Stu, you know, as you point out, like our main purpose, purpose of existence is to be an advocacy organization and to speak on behalf of the leading E&P companies in Washington yep. to Congress, to regulators, to the White House, um, to uh, educate uh, right. on the importance of, you know, domestic production um, and to yeah. advocate on behalf of the industry. And, uh, you know, it's it's not always an easy job, but, you know, we think, you know, our mission starts with education and sort of making yeah. sure people understand what the impact of these policies will be. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it goes all the way to advocacy. So we think about, you know, creative ways to to try to, um, you know, encourage people to really understand and put policies forward that support domestic production. So being a mom to your kids yeah, or going to the Congress, which is you're dealing with probably more adult behavior with your kids. Is that a fair statement? So I have two teenagers. Oh, um, <laughs> two teenagers. So I, I actually think that's still probably true. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they've been sort of indoctrinated for, for several years now in terms of, uh, you know, just me asking oh. provocative questions about, you know, when they come home and tell me what they learned at school that day. And so oh, they yeah. just sort of turn that around and I think they go back to, to their classmates and start asking provocative questions as well, which is really fun. Oh. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I actually think it's very similar. You know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of really foundational education work on, on basics. Um, oh, but the, you know, uh, and I get, I'm sorry, I get excited and I think about 16 different questions for you there, but it's about energy. It's about elevating humanity out of poverty through low cost uh, energy, natural gas, nuclear are critical. Yep. You can't make a, you, with uh, all the teenagers and folks that are out there protesting oil and gas, windmills don't make these. Right, right, right. What row? Yep. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's really important to understand. And even, you know, issues around EVs, right? I mean, you have to drive <laughs> an EV for, I think, an average of 60,000 miles before it even breaks even when you look at the life cycle analysis. Like, that's uh, a it, lot of miles. And at, you know, at 20, uh, I've got some numbers that are at not adding up. So okay. add 20, you can, you can say, Stu Turley said, oh, oh, yeah, oh, wow. it's a, and, and so it's up there because you have the resale, you have insurance prices are going up mm -hmm. and then you have, uh, the carbon footprint is getting worse because of supply chain. Yep. That number is not right. And it's the same thing with wind farms. Wind farms are not sustainable from day one. Mm. Um, and then from day one, uh, you know, be, without the tax subsidies, and then they are only sustainable with tax subsidies after to up to eight years. After eight years, the maintenance is so bad that they're being walked away from. Why do why why are they not bidding on them anymore? Why yeah. did why did all these big boys lose all this money? Right, right. Uh, how how expensive is your power in DC? Oh, I don't I don't know. I should know that. I know what my monthly bill is, but I don't know what my okay per unit power is. Well, the New York and California are two times as high as uh, Texas. In Texas, we have wind, solar, nuclear, coal, lots of natural gas. <laughs> yep. Let's do it. Let's let's have it all. 
And Texas and California has to import, I think, at least 30% of its power from other places because they've shut down production and generation within their state, right? Yeah. In the name of being green. So they just import it from other places. And you know what's even worse? Uh, buckle up, man. Are you ready for this one? I'm ready. Okay. China has, uh, they're putting in, uh, I believe it's more than a million barrels uh, capacity on their refined products. Mm. California has shut down their refined products and they're arranging to import from China gasoline. And they're trying, and they think they can do that because they're trying to get rid of gasoline and diesel. That that's it does not shock me. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything that we can do for our great uh, oil and gas producers in California? That seems to me to be a hopeless cause. You know, it's interesting. You're seeing, you know, some companies leave California um, yeah. because of the regulatory environment there. I mean, it's it's pretty brutal right now. Um, <laughs> and it's, you know, I mean, you know, we have a ton of companies that operate in states with extremely high regulatory standards like New Mexico and Colorado. Right. And at least in those states, it's more of an effort to have very high standards without maybe driving industry out of the state, right? Okay California's intention is to drive companies out of the state, it seems like. I'm okay with high standards. Let's yeah. take care of the environment. <laughs> right, right. And, and our great EMP operators do a better job than anybody else on the planet. Uh, they, they do, and, and states are some of the best regulatory bodies, you know, in this country because, you know, they really, they have the sort of institutional knowledge. They've been the, the right, right for oil and gas for a long time, um, and they understand that, you know, what works in Pennsylvania might be different than what works in Texas, might be different than what works in North Dakota, right? They're right. very different um, operating regions, and so, you know, a one-size-fits-all approach to a regulatory right scheme doesn't make sense uh, all right between us girls um yeah. who's your favorite either senator or congressperson uh to uh, visit with about this and who do you see as leading our country in a energy for all type thing and i think i just threw you on the spot you and did it's hard to choose i have so there, <laughs> there really are i mean congress gets a bad this is rap. really a friendly conversation yeah. Congress is a bad rap. um that being said there are a lot of great members of congress um and so um lot a lot of good ones so i'll just off the top of my head i'll list a couple of my favorite ladies stephanie bice from oklahoma so nice. capito from west virginia um are really great energy leaders so i'll start there um, but, you know, I think we've got a great, like, energy leadership sort of, um, just, you know, really, a, like, if you go around to, like, a lot, most of our producing states, um, yep. you've got, you've got really great, great leaders representing, maybe not, yeah. okay, there's some, there's some exceptions to that, for sure. Okay. Um, you answered that so greatly. I just interviewed, <laughs> uh, Representative, uh, Congressman, um, uh, Zach Nunn. He's a hoot. He's and really funny, yeah. I, I really, really enjoyed him. And then also Andy, uh, represent from Tennessee. Um, Andy Barr? Uh, Andy Ogles. Uh, oh, Ogles, and, yeah, 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 yeah. And he is a sharp cat. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I really enjoyed both of those. And we have about 10 more lined up. Oh, so, good. So the offer is, Ann, if you are ever visiting with anybody, I would love to have a discussion with you and some of those other women because I think that the battle is you guys need to tell us how can we help get your story out. Um, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, that, that would yep. be fun to do. And, and so that you don't have to sit there and go, hey, how do I get my story out? Hey, let's leverage our, our channels. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what do you see, how do we get around, not get around, because I like the regulatory issues, uh, that are good. How do you see yourself in 2024? Cause this is going to be a rough political year. How do you see yourself helping change the, the narrative or education? I don't know how you do it. Again, I pull my hair out. 
Yeah, so this is a tough one, and and I and I like how you framed the question because we try really hard at AXPC to be in favor of common sense regulations, right? So we're not anti-regulation. Right. Uh, we're just pro common sense, effective, workable regulations. Um, and that is a very difficult needle to thread for regulators. I will say, you know, we look at the most recent uh, EPA regulation on methane that just came out, and you can see a lot of signs where yep. the agency is trying to do the right thing directionally. I think there are some really good components of it. Right. You know, I think there are definitely some flaws in terms of workability, in terms of disincentivizing some of the technologies that our companies are really utilizing and employing. They're going to be so critical to yep. continuing the sort of trajectory that we're on in terms of continuing to drive down emissions. Um, so it's imperfect. And, you know, we hope to continue to work with EPA to make it better um, or to reconsider some of those proposals. It does feel like some of the regulations kind of go downhill from there, right? The, the <laughs> you know, the methane tax we're still waiting on, um, but that's going to be, you know, a, a tough pill to swallow for a lot and something that we're, we're, we're going to work really hard on because, um, you know, first of all, you know, w- you know, we think it's pretty punitive against U.S. companies and, you know, should never have passed in the first place. Um, you on top of that, you layer the subpart W revisions, which is changing the underlying math, and it's going to inflate right. every like artificially inflate everyone's reported emissions. Um, and so this is that's going to be a huge problem because it's going to make it look like U.S. production, you know, emits somewhere in the magnitude of like triple what it currently does, not because we're emitting more, but because they're changing the underlying factors and inflating some and double counting some. Wow. And so, that to me is like sort of the, um, sort of the 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 regulatory issue that sh- it should be getting more attention than it right. is right now. Um, so it's only in the proposed rule phase. We haven't seen a final rule yet, but that's going to be a big area of focus for us wow. next year. You know, getting hammered by the regulatory issues with scope one emissions, I can understand that. Scope two. Eh, scope three, what the hell? Come on. I mean, come on. I mean, yeah, it's um, the analogy I heard is it's like punishing farmers because, you know, uh, you know, there's too much calories in this cookie or because people are eating like, you know, the cake cake on the the dessert menu, right? I, I saw that same thing and I, it was a guy from uh, the Middle East. He was one of the oil leaders in oh, the Middle East. He, I, don't, yeah, he said, I don't remember where I saw it, but it's, it, it's, it's a, a great, great analogy, thing. right? Yes. Like once we produce this product and it, you know, someone buys it and uses it for another purpose and then sells it down the road, we have no control over what. Right. Oh, no. Or we don't have the ability to, um, you know, control how the emissions are used. We don't have the, you know, you know, you know, so as long as there's demand for our product, product we're going to keep making it. But um, to sort of punish us because then people are using it um, or to somehow use that to evaluate or score us is like, right. you know, it's just kind of, it's just nonsensical. Oh, yeah. I, I'll, t- I'll tell you, you have your work cut out for you. How can people help your council, you know, the great uh, American uh, American Explor- uh, EMP council, how can they help you? So you, you need help. Yeah. I'm sorry. So I do. We need all the help we can get. So uh, if you go to our website, axpc.org, there's um, an area, there's a link where you can sign up for our updates. Um, okay. And that provides information both on sort of uh, updates out of Washington in terms of what's happening here on the Hill, what's happening in regulatory bodies to keep you updated and informed um, okay. when it makes sense. It also says, you know, write your congressman on this issue. So we make it incredibly easy. Um, and then we send out, you know, as we're getting into an election year, you know, we'll also be sending out sort of don't forget to register to vote. And here's, you know, how you can how you can vote, um, because just get, being engaged through this process is incredibly important. And, um, 
individual voices, even though it might not seem impactful collectively, make a huge difference. And so, All right, this is this is a joke, and don't be offended. But is there any way you can start firing up a mail-in ballot uh, for anybody that likes energy, and maybe you and I can drive around and collect all those <laughs> mail-in ballots? <laughs> I know it's tempting. It's tempting. <laughs> Uh, that was for our podcast listeners. Uh, I think poor old Ann was um, uh, blinded by my uh, flesh colored bald head because the <laughs> sun got in her eyes and she actually thought that other joke was funny. So, you know, I'm sorry about that, Ann. But again, thank you. You got a uh, last word coming around the corner. What are your thoughts for this uh, upcoming ideas or anything? Your last words. Last words, you know, I would just say um, if you are an energy worker, like be incredibly proud of what you do because it is incredibly important. And I, for one, am very grateful. My team is very grateful. So I think we start from a place of gratitude. And then number two is get involved. And, you know, again, you know, you can go to our website. It's one an easy way to get involved. Um, okay. You know, vote uh, both in primaries and generals. Mm -hmm. Make your voice heard, you know, any way you can think to do so. I love that. Vote early, vote often, but then that one guy that did say that got thrown in jail, or they tried to put him in jail. Vote early, vote, vote often. Vote early. We'll just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, or vote when, you know, uh, my grandparents have voted like six or seven times in the last last elections, and they've been dead for all these years. <laughs> I am kidding. That is a joke, everybody, on joke. the podcast. Thank you so much, Ann, for stopping by the podcast. I appreciate you. Thanks, Stu. Great to chat. Yeah.